Hey, welcome back to the Isaac Jardin Podcast. Today, I talked to Cade Hansen. He's a freelancer currently based in Denver, Colorado. He helps businesses create systems to make their businesses run smoother, including creating automation, sales funnels, all that fun stuff. He's also a beast at photo video and has a ton of experience with that. This kid's just a freak of a human in the best way possible. You're going to love this one. Let's get into it. Hot dog. Hot dog. What have you been up to? Uh, nothing much, just came back from volunteering at an ultra marathon and then I'm wrapping up a whole bunch of work this week and a bunch of edits before leaving for Alaska Saturday. So gotcha. And yeah. How, how long is the Alaska trip? Um, that'll be a week up in Glacier Bay sea kayaking. And then I come back and head to Minnesota for a rock climbing trip and then come back. This will be two weeks of go, 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 go. So right now is clearing all the, uh, the backlog, getting everything out. I mean, right. enough of my plate to worry about for two weeks. Be nice. Yeah, yeah. And you volunteering for ultra marathoning, dude. That's crazy. Not just like, you know, the 24.2 miles, but exceeding that. Nuts. Yeah, this is a 100 miler, and you see. Good. And fearing. <laughs> like, well, running it. I'll have my first 100 miler in August. Um, I did a 70 miler earlier in the year, but I. Getting people through 100 miles, you see, it, it feels like a different world that you're in because you're in the middle of nowhere in Colorado watching people go from happy day one at 4 a.m. to every conceivable human emotion and anything that could go wrong. Um, yeah, there's one guy who tore his uh, LCL and he was giving himself uh, lidocaine injections during the race. Mile 30 tore it, which oh. keeps your knee from bending out to like the right um, and he tore that. He pushed on through. There's some lady there who was, uh, that was her breakup run where she was not in shape. She's like, I'm just going to run this thing because her boyfriend broke up with her. Oh my like, God. Oh. So, yeah, it's it's, a, it's an amazing community. Uh, yeah. Dude, honestly, that is a great way to cope with a breakup. I'm not going to lie. Like, that's, that's insane. Uh, do you have any like running experience at all, or did you just randomly get into ultra marathon? Yeah, no, I I ran cross country in seventh grade because my parents forced me to, and then I hated it. And then a year and a half, two years ago, I was I read uh, a little bit too much of David Goggins and decided I'd do something. Yeah, ran it two races without training, and then didn't run all of last year. And then um, end of last year, I was like, I probably shouldn't <laughs> be a slob on a couch, and then signed up for a thirty hour event. And goodness yeah. gracious, so you're it's all mental for you, like. Well, you're in you're in shape a little bit, but yeah, yeah, exactly. See, I'm not in the spot where I'd want to run quite yet, but I was I was talking to someone and I'm like, there's no way running isn't like all mental. I feel like you could probably run a marathon if you're in decent shape and you could just do it. Someone insisted, no, I have to train to do it. You have to like there's just, that's impossible not to. I'm just like, I don't know if that's the case, but. Yeah, I think if, if you extend the time horizon long enough, the point that you'll always win is is the key, meaning like you can't go from no training to running, let's say, a sub three-hour marathon. But yes. and I was talking to a friend about this. Like if you gave yourself 12 hours, you could run a marathon without training. Right. And the same way with, with a 50 or 100 or a 200-mile race, it's based off of your training, your preparation, how much time do you need? And it's... Yeah. Like the 100 mile race to 38 hour cutoff, which is it's difficult, but it's not really a training barrier, right? Like a sub 24 hour 100 mile finish would be you got to train a lot for that. And it really right. is a thing, right? Right. 38 hours, as long as you keep moving, right? Um, push through all the pain from a right. mental standpoint, right? You're gonna make it in, in 38 hours, exactly. You're gonna, you're gonna finish. It might not be pretty, but if you have okay, yeah, yeah, so that that kind of yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's, I feel like it's a good thing to do. Like, have you really lived life if you haven't done a marathon at one point? Like, honestly, like, I feel like it's such, so good for the mental. I think just, just something that challenges you and grows you as a person. Right. I think as soon as people stop choosing to face adversity, it's just, you, you get, st you become stagnant and then you never grow as a person. Right. Um, you see people that, that push themselves and you can only grow when you're outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. And so whether your choice of getting outside of your comfort zone is, um, 
business or running or baseball or um, studying hard in school or whatever it is, like choose your heart yeah. and do something that'll get you outside of your comfort zone so you can grow. Um, and I think at least why, why I started to choose running is like, like if, if to, to go play soccer, like professionally, or even just out and about in the area, like you don't want to be the worst person on your team, but with running, it really is, especially at that distance, a mental thing. Um, and I, I watched people in way better shape than me quit. Um, I just refused to give up and I didn't do a ton of training. And so if you're outside of your comfort zone, you're growing, you're doing these crazy things, um, without needing to train for forever. My, my 70 mile race was, uh, four weeks of training and 14 training runs to go from couch to just, because it's, it's 30 hours. It's not like 70 miles in 17 hours. It just, yeah, you just keep on moving. Exactly. Just move forward. Even if it's steps. Yeah. No, that's crazy. Uh, I've done very like simple hikes. We we go out on this men's retreat thing or whatever, and going up those fourteeners, which you know, like the like pretty easy ten mile, you know, two thousand elevation climb or whatever. But still, it's like once you get toward the end of that, it's like little steps, but at least keep going forward. It gets hard fast. Um, and there's a lot of a lot about business that I've that I've learned from doing these races. Um, yeah. cause it, it's more or less the same skills where business, especially as, as a freelancer, it, it's not a sprint. Um, it is, it is a very long-term thing yeah. and you have to stay patient, present and deliberate in everything that you do. Um, and my last race was a 50 miler and I was just the first half of the race. I was doing well-ish. I know I was slow. I had too yeah. much, not like, but I was moving forward. But then the cutoff started coming in where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make all these times. And yeah. one of the runners in front of me, um, she she's an absolute unit where she has her splits every single for some of these loops within a minute of each other. She controls all the variables. And I went, um, she's done 200 mile races. And I go, if I just look at her heels the whole time for the last 26 miles, I will cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. And that was everything. Um, and in coaching people through some of these races and, and myself through them, it's, if you start thinking about like the finish line at any point, you're you're gonna quit. Versus all I gotta do is make it to the next aid station or take another step. Um yeah. the more you can stay present and not overthink things, the more you can stay deliberate where it only takes one rock to roll your ankle and you're done. Where if you start thinking too far ahead or distract or whatever, you don't wash your feet, you're gonna roll your ankle and you will be done. Um yeah. and then and then patience being you're you're you can't just run until you're until you're tired. You have to go. This is going to take 17 hours or 38 hours or 200 hours, whatever it is. You have to stay very, very patient and know that as long as you control the inputs, as long as you make sure that you're not making mistakes and you just hold the standard, you are going to cross the finish line. It doesn't make it any easier, but you just have to keep going. And I think the same with freelancing of. Um, moving to Colorado without a client base, without anything. The first six to eight months were the hardest I've ever worked, doing 117 plus hour weeks and just an absolute grind. But I knew that if I stayed patient, present, and deliberate, a year in, things would be a lot better. And sure enough, just by controlling the inputs, by doing those three things and being it for the long game, I knew that a, a year from moving, I would be doing well. Um, but those first six months were just like, I'm, I'm not worried about the first six months making no money, just grinding. I knew that if I held the course, held the standard a year, I would cross the finish line. Um, and even now, as I look at my business, there's a lot of ways that I want to develop. Um, and you, you can't rush it and you can't get overwhelmed. You have to stay patient, present and deliberate. That's incredible, dude. Cause I even see it in my life right now. I'm like, I'm looking too far ahead and it's like, well, what can I do today? You know, it's like edit some dang clips, you know, uh, <laughs> watch some classes or whatever. Just like stay focused on today. It's like, you're not going to make it. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, that, that, that's on the head for sure. Um, and talk yeah. If you, if you extend the, uh, the time horizon long enough where you go, you're not going to be a successful freelancer one month in. But if you gave yourself 10 years, like, could you be making six figures a year? Yeah. If you gave yourself 10 years, you could get to that point. Yeah. Um, and it's just, 
extending the time horizon long enough that you're guaranteed to win more or less. Right. For sure. Uh, I guess I haven't really talked to you about um, what got you to go to Colorado um, to pursue freelance. Yeah. Um, so I originally grew up in Minnesota. Yeah. Um, I moved out with my parents uh, senior year of high school, uh, halfway through my senior year of high school during lockdown. We didn't tell my school or anything that I was doing because um, we didn't know if there's going to be a problem. So we played it. Uh, just we're not going to tell anybody. Moved out and then went out to California for a year after that. Um, was going to film school and working in the industry and learned a lot more working in the industry. Got to the point where I was losing projects because of school went. I'm going to move back to Colorado. My first time in Colorado, I didn't develop a client base there. I um, was primarily working with Minnesota clients and um and so i came back went i think a year from now i think i'm on, i'm gonna be in a good place starting from nothing in a city where i knew basically nobody because i was there for six months and didn't do business there yeah. um so i was effectively starting from nothing and i went i think if i give it a year of hard work i'm gonna be in a good place the time horizon is long enough that a year of hard work is gonna work um and, and yeah i just realized that as much as i love the film industry and working in California, that's not something that I wanted to do when I was 45. Yeah. Um, and didn't particularly like that lifestyle. I, I was doing well, and at 20, I, I loved it. But I knew I couldn't be wrapping sets at 4 a.m. if I ever wanted work-life balance or a family or whatever it is. And I like the mountains better than uh, hot, uh, polluted California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a great place to visit for a week, for sure. Uh I'd be there for a little longer than a week. It's a good place, but like you said, yeah, it's something about just the peace, yeah, for sure. Um, when did you start getting into film? Was that something you just went into film school because you liked it? I think I saw you, Henry, and Vlad doing like a like a photo project in high school or something. Yeah, so I um, started in elementary school. I uh, realized that I had some natural capacity for making banger eye movies and <laughs> had, it's a class project. Anytime there's an option to do a video instead of a paper or a presentation, it's like, I'm doing video. Um, and that just started developing organically and through middle school and through high school, every time I had an option to do video for class, I would do a video for class and went from spending an hour on an eye movie to in middle school, there's a few projects I'd spend 20, 30 hours on. I was like, I just love what I'm doing. And I have an idea of what I want the final product to be. And so I'm just putting in the work and loved what I was doing. It was like way above what anybody expected. Um, and then it just kind of grew organically from there. Sort of getting requests from family and friends and people that saw my school projects to go from doing free shoots or events or whatever it is. Started working for my high school, doing all their um, events um, and sports photography, managing their social media. Loved doing that. And then went... I think that I could make money doing this for real. Um, yep. Invested a bunch of money that I, I'd worked uh, landscaping since I was 12, threw all my landscaping money into camera equipment and online courses, and then just kept the same trajectory. Um, and I was talking to a friend today who was wanting to get into freelancing and building an agency and all these things. And he was worried about like things you worry about like five years into your career. I was like, you just get started. And if you do good work and you keep putting in work, it's going to grow and everything's going to figure itself out as long as you hold the trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything started from making iMovies and just as developed organically from there. Yeah. Yeah. Figuring out problems like, you know, how do I figure out my camera settings rather than being like, oh, how do I get a livable wage day one? It's like, no, no fig figure out the beginning spot if you don't know anything for sure. I love yeah. that. That's why um, I love I always recommend people to start early, especially in the creative world, because it takes a lot of time of just you're passionate about it and you you feel dumb and you just put in the work and you learn a lot of things, especially in the creative world. And so working with first Henry and then Henry and Vlad on projects was like, I have no clue what I'm doing and you don't have any clue what we're doing, but we're just doing things and yeah. growing there. Um, you just have to put in a lot of time before you even think about money. And that's why I see a lot of people that start young do really well, just because like when I went off to film school, I already had a successful company and been shooting stuff for, depending on you count up between two and eight years worth of stuff. 
Right. And so when I showed up, I knew what I was doing and could elevate. And, and I, I leveraged film school in, in, a, um, in a really good way. But I saw the people show up to film school not knowing anything and thinking they were going to come out on the other end as professionals. And like, right. no, you, you have to put in the time and all of the hours of just doing dumb things and making mistakes for your kids yeah. about making money. And that's what hangs a lot of people up is you yeah. have to be passionate about it and put in the hours. Yeah, before you can start stacking skills and building a business. Especially when you're wanting to do it on your own. Like if you want a cookie cutter spot, I mean, yeah, there's there's stuff out there for you. But if you want any side of the creative stuff alone, like you got to know the dirty stuff too or the back end stuff. Like you have to uh, for sure. That's where I saw a lot of people um, at film school. They all wanted to go from graduation right to directing and writing. Yeah. And you're like, no. You haven't put in any of the work. And so everybody has a lot of people come out of film school and um, have no clue what they wanted to do. And they couldn't get any jobs because they're like, well, I can't get any jobs like writing TV shows. And you're like, yeah, of course. Like you haven't put yeah. in the time. Yeah. Versus you can learn the technical stuff first. Like nobody who really knows lighting or knows how to really operate a camera or knows a hard skill, they're never out of work. It's some people that want to do the the writing the directing and all of the pretty fancy things and just the creative that i i see not um not doing well versus if you know a technical skill really well you're not going to go out of work um and over time you start stacking all those skills on top where you go from being a pa to be a lighting pa to being a grip to being a gaffer to being a director of photography to directing over the course of 30 years uh um, yeah yeah no yeah for sure and it, it all starts with uh, just trying it. Um, one thing that you touched on is you you managed your school stuff, which was huge. I think that's probably one of my not. I don't really have too many regrets because I'm just like, all right, whatever, move on to the next thing. But if I were to like look into like how to you know enhance my experiences a little more, just like getting involved with your school is a great way to start. I mean, they want student made content. You know, they want to see that, and they'll, they'll give you a platform. I mean, they gave you a platform. Of course, my school would have given me a platform because there's, like, 80 people a grade, but it's a great place to start. But <laughs> Yeah, I think everything is, is just starting. Um, I was talking to a friend just before this um, who was wanting to start an agency. He's still in school, about to graduate, and their big capstone project is coming up with uh, basically developing a, a digital marketing agency. And I was telling him going right to building an agency is like going from not running to like competing at the Olympics for a marathon. Oh, yeah. And everything in school that they were teaching um, was just all the high level, like how do big directors do it? How do big agencies do it? How do all these super professionals who, who have 40 years of experience, how do they do that? But that doesn't teach you how to go and run your first 5K or run your first mile or do your first hike. Yeah. And it's one thing to talk about like, well, elite runners do this or big agency owners do that is a very different game than just making a video for the local coffee shop. Yeah. And, and you have to start running your, your first races or getting your first like baby clients, whether that's your high school or family friends. And then you start stacking skills instead of just copying people at the top of the game. Yeah. yeah I love it. Overnight successes take 10 years. Meaning, like, you see a lot of people that are like, oh, this no, this director who nobody knows just put out a big movie, and it's doing really, really well. It's like, yeah, they've been working in the industry for 20 years. It's not a film school graduate two years later who's like, oh, and I have a box office success. Oh, yeah. And you put in the work, and you stack the skills, and you build up, and you learn in practice versus in theory. Yeah. And everything takes care of itself versus stressing about how the high-end people do it. It's like, just get started with, with yeah. something. Yeah, well, the high-end stories that people are going to be seeing is, like, the exciting entertainment stuff. It's not informative. It really is. I mean, it, it a little bit, but it's more on the entertainment side. So, yeah, it's not an accurate representation of, like, all right, how do I step in? So, for sure. Uh, what, are you, what are you primarily focused on right now? How did you what, – what did you really uh, develop in your first year in Denver to, to get traction going? Yeah. Um, the big thing that has allowed me to stay afloat and that I'm really focusing on um, is what I call turnkey digital marketing, which is um, 
video and photo and all these things that a lot of freelancers do are good. But a lot of times businesses, real pain points are how to implement those things and how to build a successful business where you, you give somebody a cool video and it's a cool video, but unless they know how to implement that thing into their business, it's useless for them. Um, and so when I talk to business owners, photo and video and all of the creative stuff and social media is part of the puzzle. And what I focus on is like, how do we take people from social media, get them to the website, teach them more about the product, um, quell any of their objections, get them to book, move them through the booking process, really develop that customer experience, that customer journey, and then keep them and get the Google reviews, all of that. There's building a system around that photo and video. So it's turnkey, meaning there's um, either um, automations or systems into how a business operates. And that instantly makes um, that instantly makes what I do more valuable because it's not just a thing. It's a solution to a really big pain point versus just, I have a bunch of money to spend on something. I want a cool looking video. Um, yeah. And, and that's certainly a market that people that, that people work in is really cool videos and very creative, but it's, it's very hard to find those clients versus I know I can walk into any chamber of commerce or any networking meeting and sell, um, there at least be, I, I can walk into any meeting and have a product that I can sell to about 75% of the people there because it's a solution, not just a cool yeah. thing. Where did you, where did you, uh, first run into that? So obviously you got photo video down and that's probably how you started going to businesses where did you start to realize like what i'm giving isn't quite valuable enough and like where did you where'd you run into that the biggest thing that's revolutionized my business is just listening to clients where if you stop talking and you just listen to especially when you're not at just networking meetings but you're out with lunch with them or you're hearing what they're complaining about you start hearing what their real pain points are. Or if you're selling a lot and going from nobody to clients, there's a lot of rejection involved. And like, what are the objections that people are raising? And you just start listening. And before you jump to conclusions, I see a lot of freelancers try to shoehorn their services into a client's world. It's like, no, no, listen to what are their pain points for that particular avatar, and then start developing a product that actually helps them. And that will sell 800 times better than going, oh, this is what I do. Uh, you need this thing versus what do you need? Great. I'm going to offer you that. Yes. No, 100%. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty new to this scene, but you, you more than anyone have talked a lot about, you know, going to meetings, going to networking events, being involved in the, or sorry, the chamber of commerce, not specifically the one I, <laughs> um, uh, where did, where did you get into that? Um, when I moved to Colorado, I realized that I didn't know anybody who could be a potential client. And yeah. so I had to go meet potential clients. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I started my business for the first time in Minnesota at 17, it was really nice because I had a network between friends and family friends and people on teams, whatever it is. A lot of people knew me. And then once I started telling them I did video, that naturally disseminated to yeah. maybe two, 300 people that knew that I did that versus Colorado. My first time in Colorado, I was like, how come nobody's reaching out to me? Like, well, I'm not getting work. And I was like, well, cause nobody knows me. Yes. Yeah. So I moved back the second time. I realized nobody knows me and I have to change that. I have to build a network. I have to build a community. Um, and getting out there to business networking events, two chambers of commerce, there's, there are good networking events and there are bad networking events and there are good chambers of commerce and bad chambers of commerce. And there's, there's a bajillion different types of events of varying qualities, but they're all people. And if you can consistently show up, um, my first three, four months here in, in Evergreen, nobody wanted to talk to me, but after they saw me show up for four months in a row to every single event, they went, oh, this isn't a fly by night type of guy. This isn't, isn't somebody from anywhere that just trying to get us services. I built business owners that I could shake hands with and say hi to and ask what they're doing because last time I was there, they're talking about their weekend trips. And then I see them two weeks later and you ask them about those trips and you build a community. And so it's more out of necessity. Um, I don't think anybody loves going and meeting strangers for the first time, um, but it was either meet strangers or go broke. And I decided to meet strangers and it ended up working out. Yeah, and now they're not strangers. Now you probably enjoy talking to them. Um, yeah, yeah, now they're the people that I 
that I talk with, that I go to their family's events and I send them memes and we send texts and you yeah. have fun. Um, and I think the big thing with networking is if you can stop trying to sell yourself at a networking event and just talk to people like a normal human being, you will stand out. And that was my mistake of showing up to networking events first was like, how do I give out business cards? How do I get people's numbers? How do I set meetings? How do I promote my services? And then once I just started taking interest in people and asked them about uh, where, where you live in, in Evergreen and what are you doing this weekend? And like, oh, that thing on the news is crazy. People are so relieved at networking events when you can just talk about normal human things yeah. instead of very vague leading questions that you can then use to sell people on. Yeah. Um, and, and if you can earn people's trust and show them that, that you're a real human being, um, people buy things from people that they like. And if you can just be authentic and connect with people, the selling will take care of itself if you have a good product. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are you involved in any other ones besides the evergreen specific ones? Or have you branched out further? Um, I go to um, a great networking event called uh, Network in Action. There's um, there's chapters all over the country. I think there's 400 maybe different meetings across the country. Um, it's, it's pricier to get into, um, but that also means that all the leads are qualified. You're only meeting once a month, but instead of open networking where it's just schmoozing people all day long, it's activities that all the business owners are doing together to work on their business. Right. And so that's going through... Um, talking about what are they like how do you use networking and social media in your business together and you have a group discussion or what are those limiting beliefs and how are you running your business off of fear awesome great workshop there or there's a speaker coming in whatever it is you're working with other business owners on your businesses and there's a certain level of vulnerability there versus just hey bob um i do this and i'd love to set a meeting yeah is it was a much uh, yeah, you're not building as much of a relationship versus showing up with other business owners, qualified business owners every single month. Right. And those connections um, flow naturally from there just by having a, a ticket to entry. Um, I, I know that that price to get into that networking event is the, my starting price for my services. So I know that everybody who paid this can pay this, yeah. um, which is easier to sell yeah. versus uh, finding a, like a, a broke cupcake shop at a yeah. chamber of meeting yeah yeah no for sure no that's that's awesome uh and i was talking to another uh maybe it's giles um just about how like this is a different type of subscription like this is a subscription if you want to call it that or dues or whatever this subscription enables you so like paying this big amount it's not like oh i get nothing from this it's like no like you can you can scale with this um so it's 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 just changing your mindset towards it a little bit um, and I think and in a lot of sales and networking is, is flipping from features to benefits, which is like the oldest thing in the book, right? It's, it's nothing mind blowing, but it takes a lot of practice when you're talking to people in conversation. Um, as creatives, we're very, very passionate about how we make our things. When you're talking to creatives, you can talk about lenses and camera bodies and all these technical things all day long. And I can nerd out about that stuff. But you talk to a business owner and they could not care less. And it bores them and they don't understand how your new Sigma 18 to 35 lens that you just got on oh, yeah. Amazon, their business, Go. versus you flip that around and talk about how a video can benefit their business. Yeah. And all the back end takes care of itself. Um, and so it's, it's more of a habit and a skill versus just like a mind blowing thing. Because everybody knows that it's a harder thing to, to build that in, into practice. Um, and the more you just talk about how, how what you do benefits people and you only talk about the benefits you get them interested you can answer all the technical stuff um but you just start with those benefits and then you sell from there versus um telling them how expensive your camera is isn't normally a good sales pitch yeah yeah no definitely i mean even workshopping my own life right now i don't think i'm involved with enough networking things um I, it's just so like like you said just being a person around people like if you're a desirable person, I mean, it's, it's going to go well. I mean, that's just how it goes. Um, I I just did an event. I'm like, yep, I probably should volunteer for this. We literally just stood around a, a fire hazard zone for the fireworks on 4th of July. And I stood, I stood in place by myself with a purple shirt telling people to go away for, for three hours. 
But like I had fun. I, I, I was on my phone sending memes of like I, I had I stood up and took a screenshot of a video of me standing and then I put a Gandalf face on me and said, You shall now pass. It's like you can make such a <laughs> I was bored out of my mind, but it's important. People want to see that from you. Um it's good stuff. Um and I mean as a freelancer, you have to increase your service area of luck. Yeah. Meaning, if if you're out in the community and there are 500 to 1,000 people that know of you, yeah. and of those, let's say 500, there's 100 that you see regularly, and of those, there's 50 that you're talking to consistently, you are bound to every single month out of those 1,000 people, one of them is going to reach out to you. Yeah. Where freelancing isn't luck, meaning it's it's unknown how things happen. But if you are a member of the community, people see you volunteering at community events mm-hmm. and you're helping with the Chamber of Commerce or a networking event yeah. and you're involved in sports teams or things outside of work and you just know people around the community, somebody is bound to need content that month. Um, and so the more you can increase that surface area of luck, meaning there's more people that are added, added to your network at a, B, and C grade leads, you are going to have work. Um, but it just takes increasing the number of people that know you and you won't be out of work. Yeah. Um, again, workshopping my life and I'm assuming other people's, uh, I think we've grown up hearing like social media, social media, social media, social media to the point where I've forgotten about this too. You know, it's like, it's not pushed as hard. Like people aren't like, being like oh the chamber like right away as much anymore or at least if my brother wouldn't have been involved in another local chamber and said hey if you're gonna do this business thing you probably should look at getting involved i probably wouldn't look toward that right away because it's like oh i should just be posting every day and that's how i'm gonna get business it's like well some of these people that are gonna be paying you aren't quite there yet um so yeah off with that media is a great tool for building your network and staying in contact with people. Yeah. There unless you are an expert in your field or you have a particular business model, you're not going to go viral. Right. Um, and I work with a lot of local businesses that their goal on social media is to reach ten thousand followers. And you're like, that that's completely useless because it's people from New York and California and Canada and India and all over the place. Right. You got views. But the real way to use social media is you meet people in the community or at networking events, you give them a follow, and now you're in their feed every single day. Yeah. You're increasing that service area of luck where that in-person activation is how you meet new people that are qualified leads that you actually want in your network. And then social media is staying in contact with all of them. If you have a thousand followers as a local business, that's all you need if those are good followers. Yeah. Um, what we are creative or a restaurant or whatever. If you have 10,000 followers, 9,000 of them are useless. You need people who are actually qualified and especially as a freelancer um, who works in a local area. Like if, if you're a big marketing agency or a, a true agency in the truest sense of the world working across the US, a standard offer and a standard target demographic, all those things, you, social media can be leveraged to get a lot of followers. But as a creative, as a freelancer, where you just, you do great work, you only need a few hundred people that you know, and then just show up for them. And those followers from across the country are bonus stuff. Those followers aren't going to lead lead to work necessarily. Yeah, no, true, true. Well, I might start looking into Des Moines events too, which is just 30 minutes down the road for sure. No, that's that's good. It's good stuff. Yeah, because well, if you're meeting people, I mean, I talk to a lot of realtors and especially them, they, they really want to go viral online. And you're like, you're, you're not there. There are a, more, um, more realtors online than there are like grains of sand on the beach. And you're not going to stand out because a lot of, especially realtors at the beginning, like, and honestly, like, I don't know why somebody who doesn't know you would follow you because you're not a real estate expert. If you're, if you've been in the industry for 40 years, you might have great advice to give to people across the country, but as a realtor, like you just want to all the people that you know in your circle stay in front of them every single day. Yeah. That's about all you need to, to run a successful business like that. Right. Well, and yeah, local realtor, especially if you're not an expert, you only want local followers. I mean, really like to convert. I mean, if you want to go viral on social, that's a different goal or whatever. Um, so I, I, 
I talked to you about it, but I've been working with a local real estate agent, um, and we do pretty locally directed videos, where, which I believe are going to be more effective, like highlighting local restaurants. So it's like, oh my gosh, the local business owners hyped because they got a free video about their restaurant, stuff like that. Um, but we did we did put out home decorating videos, which are a little more broad, um, and they did more well to the point where you know I was able to quadruple quadruple her followers and like exciting cool or whatever but what are those followers really going to do for her probably not that much minus make her follower count look a little higher um so totally you don't need virality especially if you're a local business kind of what we're targeting at and in in social media some posts are for views and some posts are for your brand uh, yeah meaning that some of the posts like when I manage client social media where you're you're just you're you're just looking to get eyeballs on your stuff versus some posts i am completely fine with having them have almost no likes compared to the viral stuff but those are the posts that really make a difference where a lot of people get cut out it get um, caught up in just views and some of those metrics not how is the business doing um one of my current clients i run social media for an ultra marathon series we have a few posts that go really big and get new eyeballs in and then there's a few posts that I don't care if they do as well. And it's getting volunteers. It's getting runners. It's actually getting money in and developing a sense of brand in people's mind for those qualified leads. Um, and so when I'm making content. I'm not always thinking, how can I make this the shortest or fastest? It's what do I want this post to do? What's the value that I want it to provide? And then how do I provide that value? Um, yeah. And for really engaged members in that community, it's longer short form content and getting to know people's stories. Which I know if somebody from across the world isn't going to care about, and I don't care that they don't care. It's this post is going to get another 15, 20 signups for the next race. And that's what, that's, that is what matters. And so when you can look at what, what are my creative services meant for and have those be the KPIs instead of just it looks cool or it got views or whatever it is, think about how does your creative stuff actually help businesses. And, and that mindset has completely shifted my business. Right. And I, I think this is kind of a, it's maturing in this social media uh, setting. Like I'd say three, maybe even less years ago, my only goal was high numbers. Like I feel like everyone was running to get that. But now that we've been in it for a few years, we're like, like me and you care about that a lot less. It's like, yeah, make a boring post that's going to get the engaged people to get those volunteers. That's what it's about. Um, totally. Yeah. And that's when, when you put the business owner first, you put your client first and actually listen to them. Um, a lot of things change in your business where I could nerd out about lighting and working as a gaffer or the technical side or the creative side all day long. And that's what I love. Um, but if you focus on how can you benefit businesses, you will never be out of work if you have a good product. Um, and, and yeah, you, you start stacking these skills where at the beginning, you can't worry about like, well, how do I package this product to really help business owners? It's just like learn your exposure triangle first. Um, and over time, you advance from like, how do I get this thing to work? And you start stacking skills of like, well, I know how a camera works. It's like, cool. Then you know how lighting works. Then you know how movement works. And then you know how to make website videos. And then you know how to make social media videos. And then you know a little bit about how to interview properly people um, so they give great in, in so that they give great answers about their business. And then on top of that, then you add some marketing overall, like how do we position this company and brand architecture? And over time, you keep stacking these skills, but you have to stack them and not jump to the top because you might learn brand branding and then it just falls to the bottom and you still don't have a business. It's not built on knowing the creative side pretty well. Yeah, yeah. And I keep thinking about your comment of just looking at that chick's ankles. It's just like you're yep. looking at one step at a time till it goes. Um, yep. That's when I when I'm struggling in a day. It's usually because I'm looking too far forward. Like even today, waking up, I'm like, man, I really just want to get these workflows down so I can look to the next thing. And it's like, no, like I've I've literally today. I'm just like. Let me focus on editing my clips. That's all I got to do today. I mean, that's what's going to send a few emails. Cool. But like, worry about today. Big time for that's where when people ask me how my business is doing, um, I always just say, I, I love the trajectory that I'm on and I'm very happy with it. Um, 
I wanted to get it to a better place. I'm not satisfied where, where the business is at currently, but I'm very pleased with the trajectory. And I know that if I can hold the trajectory of, of growth, of development, everything will take care of itself. Instead of going, oh, I'm not, I don't run a massive agency yet. It's like, yeah, there's nothing I can do in the next six months to run a massive agency. Yeah. What if I hold the standard? I know that in five years from now, I can have a really solid business with more team members on board. Um, but I can't worry about that. All I have to do is stay pit present, patient, and deliberate about everything. Um, one of the best pieces of advice that I got from my mentor is that building a business and becoming financially free isn't rocket science. It's, it's not unknown. A lot of people think like making money is I have to come up with the best idea on the planet and I have to have it perfectly timed in a market. And that's the only way to get rich. But if you focus on one skill and become an expert at one skill over the course of 20, 30 years, and you're putting in an absurd amount of work, you are going to win. Like there are a bajillion businesses and they're all doing the same thing. Um, business isn't an unknown. It's just a lot of work and nobody wants to put in that work. Um, now sure to become the next Elon Musk or Zuckerberg, you have to have a really great idea, but pretty much any business out there, especially in the creative space, it's not unknown how to get there. It's just a lot of work and you have to put it in. Um, and that if that time horizon is long enough, you are guaranteed to win. Yeah. Um, you just wake up and make a few right decisions every day. I mean, just like, and they don't even have to be right. You know, it's like three of them are wrong out of the eight. Like it's still five right decisions. You know what I mean? It's just waking up and going after it. And like you said, for 20 years, like it, it will add up. Um, when did you, when did you want to, when did you learn that you wanted to run a business rather than be a part of a business? I think early on, um, I started freelancing because I just didn't want to work for somebody. Um, and I've never had a normal job. I've been self-motivated enough and, um, not wanted to work for somebody. And so I've just kept doing this. I think as I've matured, I've seen the value of working for other people and work-life balance. I've had a number of conversations with other freelancers that are wanting to get out of the game. Um, just because they realize that it's a really, really difficult thing to become a successful freelancer. It's a lot of work and they didn't want to do that. And they want to take normal, stable jobs for, um, for stability and free time and all these things. When I first started off, I was a, a freelance absolutist. I mean, I was like, freelancing is the right decision for everybody because it's awesome and you make a lot of money. But as I've gotten older, you started realizing what real life is like and all of, um, you start realizing that everybody's life situation is different. There's not one right decision for everybody across the board. And so I've helped a lot of people get into freelancing and I've helped a lot of people get out of freelancing and every situation is different. And I just tend to say at the season I'm in in life right now, I love the, the flexibility of freelancing over the stability of a normal job. I can go on a camping trip on a Tuesday afternoon and then work the weekend, or I can go to another state for a week. Um, and that for me is why in this season in life, freelancing and all of the difficulty around it is worth it. Versus other people I've talked to in their season in life, they would prefer other things. And so they go down a different career path. Um, and I have no problem saying that 10 years from now, I, I might not be working for myself, but where I'm at in my season in life, I'm very happy with where I am. And I'm holding the trajectory. And if something changes, um, I don't think I have as many ego problems around working for myself as I used to. Yeah. I just, I love what I do. Um, and yeah, just, just holding that, uh, holding that trajectory for now. Yeah. You took that right out of my mouth. I, I, I always like to say like, I'm a lot less self-centered than I was a few years ago, but I still have it in me. Don't, don't get me wrong. I still got that in me. No, for sure. Uh, what I think it's cool about going after this too is like, sure, maybe you do join a team at some point. You're going to be a very valuable member of that team, just knowing how to do it on your own. Um, there's been a few little, little opportunities where maybe I've been looked at into asking to be a part of a team. And like the, the drive there is because of all this self-drive I have. Um, some people, some people see trying this as a setback. 
towards other things. And I, I just don't think that's true. And me and you are really diving really, really deep into it. So like we can't see it any other way. We're just going to dig ourselves out of it. But um, some people see it differently. It's crazy. I think I, I underestimated when I was starting out the value of working for somebody who's an expert in learning from them. Yeah. Uh, I thought that I had everything figured out and I was great at what I did. And the more really, really experts that I meet, the more I realize like working a year or two, especially at the beginning of somebody's career where they get to see how a successful business works and they get to learn from a master and they get the stability of things. Um, I, was, I was listening to a guy on a podcast talking about how he worked for um, a big internet guru um, to learn YouTube ads. And he spent the first three years of his career controlling his first year was multiple millions of dollars in ad spend. And he learned so much by for three years, not working for himself and working for somebody who knew what they were doing. Well, on the other side of three years, he, he had this stat of, I think he spent like $50 million on YouTube ads three years in. There's no way he could have done that as a freelancer, having controlled $50 million worth of spend. You learned so much. No. And I think for a lot of freelancers, if you know exactly what you want to be doing, working for an expert is the best decision you can make. Um, yeah. When I was starting off, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I'm confident that I made the right decision of dabbling in everything under the sun. And that's what's allowed me to figure out what I like, what I'm good at, and whether people want me to pay. But if I knew I wanted to be somewhere specific earlier on, it would have been a much better decision to go work for an expert. Yeah. Funny enough, I, I kind of view going back into a job as a setback but that's just not true at all like if if it's the right obviously if it's the right fit and something i want to learn towards but like i might have said prematurely like shoot i left this last job i said i'm never gonna work a job again that was probably a bad thing to tell myself because like you said it, it can be a very good thing to learn about um for sure uh and that's where i see my setbacks is, yeah, I got some creative knowledge. I have basic systems knowledge, but the advanced systems behind a business, I really, really struggle with. And that's something a lot harder to teach for yourself, but it's really easy to see how it's working for other people, you know? Well, I've, I've learned so much about business by going from just a creative freelancer to adding business services on top, where every week I get an intimate look into a lot of businesses and I get to figure out uh, what separates uh, a really successful business from a failing business? And I've learned so much by working on uh, client biz client businesses that are unrelated to freelancing. Um, is especially on the business side, the fundamentals of business. It doesn't matter what industry you're in or what business you're running. There's fundamental principles of business that you have to learn. Um, and I've learned so much from non-creative businesses about how I do and don't want to run my own. Um, that if you're somebody who's on the edge about freelancing, but you're in a job that you're learning things, not just collecting a paycheck. Um, I was coaching a friend through, she was taking a full-time job moving from freelancer to working for a company because she was going to learn more and from a successful company. And the reason she took the job was to learn. Um, and if, if somebody's a creative wanting to drop their job working at Subway or McDonald's, like, yeah, definitely you're going to learn more doing creative stuff. But if you're working in a family business, or for a successful business, even if it's unrelated to what you're doing, you're gonna learn so much by learning how does that business work. It might not excite you, but if you learn how that construction company you're working for, or that restaurant, or whatever it is, how that works, and stay there just a little bit longer and get involved with running that business, you're gonna learn so much about how to run your own versus just, well, I'm not picking on my camera every day at work. Um, it's like, well, are you learning things? Are you on a good trajectory? Um, and I think trajectory is the most important thing where if you are in a dead end job that you're not growing, like, like drop that and go full time into, into creative stuff all day long. I'd recommend that. But if you're in a job that's allowing you to, to progress well, just keep holding the trajectory until you're in a new season in life where you go, this job isn't making me grow or whatever else you're doing in life. Once it stops moving you forward, it's, it's time to move on to the next season. Um, whether that's business or friends or relationship, whatever it is, um, keep pulling that trajectory and realize that, 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 that life tends to come in seasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's big. I like that. And trajectory can mean you can go down for a few months, but still like 
you know, your trajectory is still going up. It's, it's the stepping stone for sure. I talk a lot about putting yourself in a spot where you don't have a ceiling. It's just like, it's my natural ability is I just want to keep going. So like, I don't want a ceiling. Um, so that's big. Yeah. Well, the, uh, when I moved to Colorado, um, I went from doing 30 and 40 grand jobs to making $0 and having to pitch my services at 200 bucks. Or if I was looking from a business decision, it would have been, it, it by every conceivable metric, it threw my business and just pretty much threw it out the window. But their trajectory of, of growth and how to run a business, I was completely fine going from a lot of money to nobody wanting to even go to lunch meetings with me. But I learned a lot and I was like, I'm not making money this first few months, but I love the trajectory. I'm learning how to put myself out there and how to network and start from scratch again for the fourth time with my business. And um, I was happy with the trajectory. Um, and there's a lot of people that um, want me to go back to, to college or want me to do all these other things or like, well, you're going to burn out or whatever you're going to do. I just go, I'm, I'm happy with the trajectory I'm at now. I'm not making a bajillion dollars in take home pay and have 12 investment properties. And um, some corporate guy was telling me that, well, you're not making this amount of money every year. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm 20 and 10 months into a new city. I'm good to to get there. Like I'm not beating myself up over not having a high paying corporate job right now um, because you're 45 and have a stable career and I'm 20 and I think I'm doing really well for my age. Um, And I told him like, if I ever miss the trajectory, if I'm 35 or 40 and doing what I'm doing now, like it's a sign that I should quit. But where I'm at, at this season in life with the current growth trajectory, um, I, I'm I'm very happy with with the trajectory I'm holding it until something changes. Yeah, it, that helps keep you content and present, and I love that. That's something that I've struggled with. Um, looking too far ahead, blah blah blah. It's like, oh, how can I enjoy today? This is really the first summer where I've just like been chilling around Ames, doing my thing, and I'm like, hey, I kind of like this daily life I got going. I don't need to go anywhere. This is nice. It's like it's nice to be in that spot. Um, if, if you're, if you're living your life out of envy towards others, towards these, you know, corporate dudes telling you what's like, you're going to, you're going to get feeling bad real quick. Yeah. For sure. Well, then if you think about where people are at our age, like, um, I think for compared to other people, our age, we're doing very well. Um, certainly compared to, um, people that are about to retire with a bunch of money in the bank, we're not at the same level. Um, but. If, if I can keep at 20 and 21 and 22 and 23, keep up that trajectory, um, I've learned so much in what I've been doing where I have a lot of experience under my belt versus people that are going to their junior year of college that still don't know what, what they have no real world application. Um, I was like, well, I'm a little bit uh, ahead of the curve on that particular um, metric. And so I'm not being myself self up over working with 45 year old business owners and making millions a year just right as long as i can hold the trajectory um, and yeah. that's that all that's all that matters um in a certain way like there, there's a lot of value of surrounding with surrounding yourself with people who are much more successful than than you um if you're around five millionaires you're gonna become the six if you're around five drunks you're gonna become the six all that type of stuff is, is really really helpful and at the same time you have to realize that you can't beat yourself up over not being where somebody is who's 15 years ahead of you. Um, so there's a delicate balance if you want those people to push yourself ahead um, and you want people that are better than you so that they move you ahead, but you can't beat yourself up for it if you can stay present and you yeah. can grow and you can improve a little bit every day. That's all that matters. Um, and one day you'll be at the same level of those five people that you surround yourself with. But if you get down on yourself and beat yourself up and have all these negative emotions, um, you can't beat yourself up into becoming successful. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm curious. This is something I'm unsure about even in my own life. Uh, but like, how do you, how, do you set goals? Are you a big goals guy? How do you do that? Um, when it comes to goal setting, I much prefer to set input goals versus output goals. Um, what I mean by that is 
somebody will set a goal of, I want to make 10 grand this month is a different goal that I'm going to reach out to a hundred people this month. You can control all of the inputs of, um, uh, yeah, like you, if you, I'd rather, if, when it comes to a goal, like you want an end result, the goal isn't the end result, it's the inputs. And I see a lot of people that set, um, result based goals and you get to the end of the month and there's no way that you can will yourself into making your financial goals for the month. Um, you can't two weeks in go, oh my gosh, I'm not at 10 grand yet. But if your goal is I'm going to go to a networking event twice a week and I'm going to send, sent, uh, two lunch meetings from each of those networking events, you can control that. And there is no reason why you cannot do that. Um, because it's just inputs. And that's how I like sending goals because you're not beating yourself up over, um, end results. You just go, if I can control the inputs, I know and have a pretty good idea that I'm going to get the result, but I can control the inputs any day of the week. And there's no reason why I should miss those. Yeah. No, I like that. So definitely my goals are definitely more towards output goals. And also a lot of my goals are like, honestly, kind of like what you said. I like where I'm going. I just want to maintain what I'm doing. Like, honestly, I, I, there's a little bit of that too. So do you have like yearly goals or is it more monthly things or how do you, how do you go about that? Um, every month it's, it's mainly just input based goals of okay. either putting out this number of projects or this number of reach outs, or we need learning these particular skills. Yeah. Especially the past few months have been much more education based goals where the money and the client side of things is going well. And the big thing that I can do now isn't just do more of the same. It's I'm going to learn these skills this month. I know that those skills will make me money next month. And can even make me money this month. But instead of going, I'm going to go from X number of dollars to this number of dollars. It's, I'm going to learn this thing this month. Or I'm going to control these inputs or I'm going to do these things. Um, and I know that if I do these things, I have a pretty good idea of that, of what the end result's going to be. Um, and the reason why I prefer that is if you set a financial, well, let's say 10 grand a month, um, you can't just think harder about it. And people get a lot of people get worked up and I, I very rarely see people hit those goals because you don't have direct control over them versus if you go, I'm going to reach out to a hundred people this month, you 100% can do that. If, if you don't make that goal, it is on you versus 10 grand, like eight grand or 12 grand, like that number is going to fluctuate versus just, I'm going to, I'm going to have lunch every single day this, this month with somebody. Awesome. There is no reason why you cannot do that yeah. versus hit 10 grand. There are a lot of reasons why you might not be able to do that that particular month. Yeah. Um, especially like those clients might buy next month or the month after, whatever it is. But yeah. Um, even in 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 running in my last race, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make all these cutoffs. But I just went, well, my only goal this race is to keep on running for 18 hours. Like that's it. I can control that. I can keep moving for 18 hours, and everything else took care of itself. And I was talking to a friend who's doing a. Uh, a hundred mile race. And I was like, if at mile 30, you're going to go, I'm never going to make these cutoffs. You're going to quit on the spot. But if you go, I'm just going to keep on moving for 32 hours. You can control that. And everything else will take care of itself. Yeah. Um, Cause I see a lot of people drop either in, in freelancing or in running or wherever it is when they go like, I'm not on the right trajectory and I'm not hitting the, the KPIs or whatever. Um, I saw people drop because of like three aid stations ahead um, over the weekend. Like, you're you're not you're not running three eight stations. You're doing one, like you, you like. There's no reason. Like I'm not gonna make three ones from now. It's like well, you can make the next two, and then you could quit, but you you can't quit for future reasons. Um, yeah. And that's why I just if you control the inputs and you have goal based inputs, works so much better than outputs on based ones. That's legit. That helps. That helps a lot. I I like ah oh, I love. Everything that you've talked about encapsulates present thinking, which has been something that I, as well as many others, struggle with. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing that I learned from this lady doing 200-mile races um, is that she controlled all of her inputs, um, meaning that her hydration and nutrition locked in for the entire race. There was no variance and nothing went wrong there. Foot care and pacing and all of these things, when she showed up to the starting line, she knew exactly what she was going to do. Um, she wasn't the fastest person on the course, and all these people at the front of the pack 
um, especially in a 200 mile race, which is three to four days of, of moving, um, where these, all these front runners that went out hot, um, they didn't control their inputs and their stomachs. Um, they had a ton of problems there and they started getting blisters and all these things because they're worried about the goal. Like they're just looking at their watch. Okay. I got to hit these paces, whatever the, the end result is. And then over the course of the races, and it's awesome watching her because she goes from back of the pack and just keeps taking souls until she's at the front of the pack over 200 milers, over 200 miles, because she's not worried about anything other than the inputs. If she's not eating enough, her pace goes back and she consumes more food. If she's getting hot spots even super early on, you're taking care of those. The, the running takes care of itself. And so all she does is control inputs and just just takes all these people's souls that are like, oh, I just got to hit my outputs. I got to hit my outputs. I got to hit me, hit my outputs. She doesn't, she barely even talks about running. She only talks about the inputs and because she only controls the inputs, she controls, um, the things that she can control versus worrying about 10 runners ahead. Um, she goes from the back of the pack to the front and never quits. Um, and that was like this eye opening thing when I was trailing her in this race of she is the most consistent. You're looking at everybody else's splits all over the place and they have no clue if they're going to make their times. She knew she was going to make her time because she's done this a bunch of times before and she she was only worried about those inputs and sure enough, she crossed at almost exactly the time that she predicted um, with a lot in the tank versus people run into all sorts of problems because they're only worried about the in output in the same way that I see a lot of freelancers drop because a certain month they don't meet their financial goal. Like it's, it's a month or even two months, whatever it is. Um, but if you're controlling your inputs and you extend your time horizon far enough, you are going to cross the finish line, um, and, and move on to the next things. Um, yeah, it's, can you control your inputs and your trajectory? And that's, that's all that matters. Hey, Oh, wow. This is good. I like that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it's been dope. I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks for coming on, bro. A lot of good stuff. Holy crap. I'm feeling motivated. Let's go kill it. Yes, sir. Hot dog. Hot dog. <laughs>